and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, my apologies for being the one that's responsible for changing program. Uh, usually, the Eurostar from Brussels takes two hours, but unfortunately today it took six hours, so that's why I'm late. Um, I've been asked to, to, uh, to introduce the uh, state of play on the raw materials initiative and also a link to the resource efficiency roadmap. I'm really sorry for having missed uh, quite a few of the presentations and also the discussions because I was really looking forward to, to hearing this. Uh, because in, from the Brussels perspective, it's very important that we get impulses from, from uh, people like, like uh, those participating in, in forums like this outside of Brussels. Um, and that also means that perhaps uh, on, on a few occasions I will, I will mention things that have already been mentioned, but I'll try to avoid uh, basic information such as this, for example, I, I realized from already listening to some of the interventions that this is probably assumed that everyone knows more or less the, the basics about the EU Raw Materials Initiative. So uh, I'll move straight then to the um, overview of the state of play, which is uh, based on this uh, report that uh, the European Commission adopted in June this year, which was just described by uh, uh, Mr. Belloc has, has not overwhelmingly impressive report. <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, this, this slide has just the, the, uh, the main uh, pillars and the main themes, and now in subsequent slides, slides I'll go into a bit more of detail, but without going into too much detail because of the time constraints. So, first in terms of the, the uh, access from the global markets, we are implementing the EU strategy for uh, raw materials, uh, we are uh, putting in place and uh, maintaining uh, a number of raw materials dialogues with third countries. We are providing some assistance to developing countries. And in terms of the second pillar, we are uh, promoting, uh, on a, I should say, on a voluntary basis, the exchange of good practice between EU member states. Uh, we are taking measures to enhance the EU knowledge base and we are promoting research and skills. And regarding the third pillar on resource efficiency and recycling, we are trying to uh, <coughs> promote better implementation and smarter EU waste legislation. And we are also uh, taking efforts to strengthen the implementation of the <coughs> EU waste shipment regulation. So first, on the first pillar, a bit more detail then. Um, in terms of our uh, trade strategy for raw materials, we have uh, negotiated a number of free trade agreements that uh, include consideration of uh, how to deal with trade in raw materials. I will not mention all the, the reasonably long list of countries that you find there on that, uh, that first bullet point. And uh, the most recent one, as you may have read about in the press, is uh, with Canada, where we have reached a political agreement uh, very recently. And we have ongoing negotiations with a number of other countries, and not least, uh, although, not, uh, although the, these negotiations are rather slow, but not least with the group of African, Caribbean and Pacific countries. <coughs> In terms of the uh, raw materials di uh, dialogues and diplomacy, um, we are promoting policy dialogues and uh, exchange of information with countries such as United States, Japan, China, Russia, Brazil, etc. Um, and in terms of the uh, development policy, we have a joint EU-Africa Union strategy and we also have a framework uh, for cooperation with African, Caribbean and Pacific States. Um, we are also taking measures to promote uh, financial and supply chain transparency. Uh, you may have heard that in uh, June this year there was an agreement on a new accounting directive which puts an obligation on large extractive and logging companies to report payments uh, they make to, to governments. Uh, and thereby further promoting the uh, Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. 
We have also uh, launched a, in terms of supply chain transparency, we have launched public, or we have carried out a public consultation on, um, in terms of uh, minerals that originate in conflict regions. And we are now preparing some sort of EU initiative in that. We are uh, carrying out an impact assessment looking at different options for that. And lastly, uh, I put development assistance in brackets, and this is because, as many of you probably know, we have to stick to the uh, principles of Paris and Busan on aid effectiveness, which means that raw materials are only um, a sector which is benefiting from EU development aid. And by the way, the EU is the biggest development aid donor in the world. Uh, if the beneficiary country identifies this sector as one of its priorities, which is not very often the case, actually. With regards to the uh, second pillar, um, <clears throat> as, you've, as, of, as already been mentioned today, uh, we are carrying out this exchange of best practice uh, with three focus areas. One is uh, on a sort of uh, general level, overarching level, uh, national uh, minerals policies. Uh, the second area is land use planning and the third area is, is permitting. Um, and we, in uh, this context, the Commission is also developing a set of indicators for monitoring developments in the member states in these, in these areas. Uh, in terms of enhancing the EU uh, knowledge base, um, we have launched several uh, studies and research projects to increase availability of data on resources and reserves and to identify um, innovative technologies uh, that could uh, be uh, the subject of possible pilot plans. We have also just started a, an EU initiative called the European Rare Earth Competency Network, or ERICOM. Um, and uh, I won't go into the details, but we have, under the seventh EU framework program, there are a number of research projects as well on, on raw materials. And on promoting uh, research and skills, more uh, looking towards the future, uh, Raw materials will be one of the, the challenges in the new um, EU Research and Innovation Framework Program, which is called Horizon 2020, and that will run from 2014 to 2040, uh, 2020. Sorry. Uh, next year we will also launch uh, a knowledge and a European Knowledge and Innovation Community on raw materials, um, and uh, internationally we have uh, a partnership with the US and a trilateral. EU, US, Japan uh, workshops uh, on research. In terms of the third pillar, which is the one that I'm personally uh, in charge of within DG Enterprise and, and Industry, together obviously with my colleagues in the Environment Director General, uh, <clears throat> there we are particularly focusing now on uh, what we call a fitness check of the uh, of a number of waste stream directives, in particular the directives on end-of-life vehicles and on batteries and packaging. Uh, we are also reviewing um, a number of waste uh, management targets, the ones that are in the waste framework directive, in the packaging directive and in the landfill directive. Uh, we are also looking a bit uh, upstream uh, at our policies in terms of uh, product design, the Eco Design Directive for uh, for energy related products in particular, <coughs> where we are currently working on refining the methodology to uh, take materials aspects into account as well when setting such uh, setting criteria for Eco Design, and uh, a report on this subject is to be uh, published next month. Uh, <coughs> with regard to the uh, actions uh, uh, on the waste shipment regulation, the Commission adopted a uh, proposal in July to strengthen the uh, inspections in the Member States of waste shipments and to do this 
uh, not, not uh, randomly, but through uh, risk-based uh, planning of inspections, also looking at uh, upstream generation of, of waste. And we are also looking into the uh, feasibility of introducing a certification scheme for recycling facilities in non-OECD uh, countries. There we uh, issued a, a report uh, that was carried out on behalf of uh, my Director General. Uh, it was uh, issued in May and we now, and that report by the way advocated uh, such a mandatory facilitation scheme, but we are now uh, uh, carrying out uh, further consultations on this subject. This brings me to the uh, link to the um, EU roadmap to, uh, to a resource efficient Europe. The goal of this roadmap is to, to achieve decoupling, uh, to decouple economic growth from uh, resource use and its environmental impacts. Uh, it has uh, three timeline, timelines, uh, short-term actions, uh, milestones for 2020 and the, and the longer term 2050 vision. Uh, three priority areas, uh, which um, the first uh, of which is shifting to a green circular economy and there there is quite a lot of focus on uh, getting the prices right and creating the right incentives. Uh, safeguarding natural capital uh, is another priority area uh, and in terms of the sectors we are focusing on three sectors, food, buildings and mobility because these are considered to be the ones that are associated with the highest environmental impacts overall. Uh, and uh, as with the raw materials initiative, uh, this is very much a shared responsibility of the EU and the member states. Um, and it's interesting that we have sort of a high level system of, of governance for, for the resource efficiency uh, roadmap because it's being reported uh, under the overall EU uh, strategy of, uh, which is called Europe 2020 for a smart, uh, sustainable and inclusive growth. So what has been done in terms of the uh, resource efficiency roadmap? Well, in 2011, the, we, the EU adopted uh, uh, a biodiversity strategy and an eco-innovation action plan. Last year, uh, actions in the area of water. This year, first of all, uh, globally, uh, follow-up uh, communication on the Rio Plus 20 uh, Sustainable Development Conference. We have also uh, recently issued a, a forest strategy, uh, including uh, a blueprint for uh, EU forest or European forest based industries. What remains to be done until the end of this year is uh, we are now uh, finalizing an air policy review, perhaps not uh, very much linked to, to uh, raw materials. We are as well working on a proposal for a new uh, energy and climate package for, for 2030, and we're working on uh, for next year, waste policy and, and targets review, as I mentioned before. So, in the interest of time, I will skip this slide, which is which is about the uh, economic incentives in terms of shifting labour to environmental taxation and uh, eliminating environmental harmful substances uh, subsidies. Sorry, this is part of the uh, resource efficiency roadmap as well. And I think this is my last plus one slide. In terms of the next steps, we are currently carrying out a <coughs> review of the EU critical raw materials list. Um, for those of you who don't, who don't know, we have this list uh, of 14, currently 14 critical raw materials. They are critical because they're considered to be, there is a high supply risk and a high importance to the EU economy. So that work is supposed to, or is expected to be finalized by the end of this year, with the report probably in, in January next year. Next year we'll also do another progress report, because this is, there is this requirement for an annual progress report. Uh, we uh, are, have put a lot of efforts uh, this year, and we'll put uh, even more efforts next year into the implementation of the European Innovation Partnership on Raw Materials, so that it was uh, mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago. Um, 
the, this European Innovation Partnership for Raw Materials is also quite closely linked to the new uh, research framework program, the Horizon 2020, and uh, also, of course, we can continue to implement the resource efficiency roadmap with the so called circular economy package in the beginning of next year. Um, and then we're also looking at a number of recommendations that we have been put forward by a uh, European resource efficiency platform. So I think I will, I will stop there. I have just another slide on, on uh, the European Innovation Partnership, but I think I skipped that one. And the last slide, uh, I don't know if they will be distributed, has a number of links. Thank you. The reason why I'm here, so my legitimacy here, is this. The German National Resource Efficiency Program, which I was in charge of developing and consulting inside the government. And I'm going to tell you a bit about the development of German resource efficiency policy. But before I do that, I actually want to take you back one minute to the first session that we've had. That's the one on challenges in the raw materials area. And when I put together my slides, I thought, well, somebody will have put on that chart already before I get to um, give my presentation, but strangely enough, nobody has. Um, that's the rise in global raw materials use. And now we've seen the hockey stick curve for um, greenhouse gas emissions. Now this is a hockey stick curve as well. So we are, we're looking at an exponential rise in the use of global, uh, global use of raw materials. And we know what the drivers are. It's population growth and it's growth in prosperity. Um, and this is the reason why at the European level, at the national level, at the global level, we have to speak about decoupling growth from resource use and of course from the environmental impacts that are associated with it. From the global perspective to our national perspective, um, Aside from the environmental problems that um, are associated with uh, raw materials use that is so quickly rising, um, we have a few specificities in, in Germany that makes the raw materials uh, policy area um, very important for us. We are an export-oriented economy. Um, we have a strong industrial base. And Germany, while being rich in some minerals, like construction minerals, stands, etc., is highly dependent on imports of metals. And if you think about the structure of German industry, um, if you think about cars, think about machinery, tools, also, yeah, very metal intensive uh, industry. So we have a high import dependency here. Um, materials actually account for 42% of the costs in the German manufacturing sector. Everybody talks about energy efficiency, but energy costs are only like 2% material costs are much higher. The German industry is highly sensitive to rising and volatile prices. Clear. So we have to look at how to secure our resource supplies, but we also have to look a lot into resource efficiency. There are three strategies that are, um, that are sort of the basis for our resource efficiency policies. The first one in 2002 was the National Strategy for Sustainable Development. The second one, in 2010, was the German Raw Materials Strategy. And the third one is, what I've shown you before, the German Resource Efficiency Program, which has one of the most beautiful acronyms in the world. I think it's Program for Resource Efficiency Progress. So. <coughs> Already in 2002, the National Sustainability Strategy came up with targets, quantitative targets, where we wanted to head at with our um, German economy um, from the political side. And one of the targets that was established was a target for raw material productivity. I think we were probably, well, we were certainly one of the first countries in the world, maybe even the first country in the world to establish a quantitative target for that. Um, we want to double raw material productivity until 2020 against 1994, because we believe that, both in economic terms and in ecological terms, that makes an awful lot of sense. Um, if, you ask us, uh, if, if you ask me, where are you with respect to your target, we're about halfway there. So, sort of on track, but there's still a lot to be done. In 2010, 
the main issue was really access to raw materials. The Chinese had just introduced their export restrictions on rare earths, and um, German industry came up to the government and said, listen, we have a problem here, please help us. Um, now the German government is actually convinced that it's industry who really has to make sure that they have the supply they need for, um, for making their business. But of course there's something that we can do to facilitate things. Um, so we came up with a raw material strategy that was very much geared towards helping with securing supply, but also not just any supply, but sustainable supply. So even at the time, in 2010, um, it was clear that one of the pillars of our raw materials policy would always be also resource efficiency because it makes industry less dependent on imports, um, we reduce sensitivity to volatile prices, and of course we're doing something for the environment. So the German Resource Efficiency Program, um, <coughs> I put down here, adopted at a very beautiful date, 29th of February in 2012, and it was adopted by the entire government. The reason why I stress that is that you can probably think that we have quite, well, quite diverse interests at the table if we talk about raw materials policy. And with the Environment Ministry being in the lead for the issue of resource efficiency, you can imagine that um, it was important that we had the whole government on board also the trade and industry ministry, also um, the foreign office, also the finance ministry. So that is, that is concern, like um, an effort of the whole government, the program. The main goal is to decouple, as I said, economic growth from resource use, because it reduces the environment, environmental impact, sorry, but also because we are firmly convinced that this improves our competitiveness. So, what we did, let's get that. I'm not going to take you through all the little details of this chart, but just to give you an idea of what the program is about, um, I'll invite you to look at sort of the center of this chart. Um, we've looked at the whole entire value chain, from extracting raw materials, by the production process, by consumption, to um, sort of the last stages of the, of the entire value chain and the framework for our raw materials use. And we've tried to um, bring together a comp comprehensive package of measures that helps us reduce raw material use at every stage here. And I'll just talk about one example of these measures in a bit more detail. And that is helping resource, well, helping small and medium-sized enterprises come to grips with resource efficiency. And um, we had a question before whether the financial sector was any important for resource efficiency. Oh, yes, it is very much so. Because um, small and medium-sized enterprises are really the backbone of the industry in Germany, also in the European Union. Um, but if a small and medium-sized enterprise is thinking about how can I reduce my materials use? Well, first of all, sometimes the small medium-sized enterprises lack awareness <coughs> how they can actually reduce their materials supply. Now that's a bit surprising, but I think you mentioned it before, Andrew, that um, <coughs> many enterprises don't actually know where their materials come from. They don't actually know the material flows. Um, and one of the other barriers is actually financing. So. If you um, contact the bank as an entrepreneur and say, I want to invest in resource efficiency, the normal bank will say, what? <laughs> and it's, it's quite hard to get, um, to get proper um, credit for that. So one of the measures that we have taken is that we offer consultancy services for SMEs. Um, we're doing this in collaboration with the German Association of Engineers, which is a great partner because if you are a person from the environment ministry and try to speak to a company about how to improve their production process, people will just smile and laugh. But if the German Association of Engineers comes along and tells you that you can actually economize on your raw materials in the production process, that has a lot more credibility. And so uh, we created a center for resource efficiency, sort of a competence center, an information platform. Um, 
which is uh, sort of similar to what RAP UK um, is doing, and I think you're going to speak more in detail about these things, but the potential gains for small and medium-sized enterprises are um, astonishing, I think, um, because in a way we're only helping them to do what makes sense um, from a business point of view anyway, but we're trying to remove the barriers. And for instance, coming back to the banking sector again, um, we have also a program um, to um, teach bankers um, on the issue of resource efficiency. Um, we have actually a program where you can get preferential um, credits um, from banks. So, if you're interested in that, I'll speak to you more. So, how did we actually manage to get this through the government? And how did we actually manage to convince industry that it was a good thing to think about resource efficiency? Um, we have an accepted target. The target to double raw materials productivity was, I think, really instrumental in bringing together the whole government um, on this issue. Our program has a narrow focus, but as opposed to, um, to the European level, where resource efficiency covers all of the natural resources, we focus on abiotic materials, which for the German industry are very important, of course. Um, from the very start, we spoke a lot with industry. We spoke a lot with all the stakeholders involved. Um, I think it's really key to communicate that resource efficiency has economic advantages. So it's not just an ecological issue. It's very much actually about competitiveness of the industry and savings. Now, what's contentious in that policy field, indicators and targets are controversial. Um, we were lucky enough to have a target already. Um, taxation and subsidies, very difficult. <laughs> you won't find much on that in the program. And new regulation. We have very good regulation in the waste management area. Um, but what we focused on in this program was really supporting industry initiatives, information, enabling activities. My final slide. Um, we have decoupling in Germany. This is actually the um, domestic material consumption in raw material equivalents. For those of you who already know of indicators, that includes um, the raw materials that, uh, that we were needed to um, produce imported goods. And um, it actually goes down in absolute terms. And we're economically quite successful at the moment. So it's possible. You can decouple and be economically su successful. So. And that's it. <laughs> I'm Peter Maddox, um, I'm from RAP. I'm um, going to tell you a bit about RAP. So RAP actually is the uh, Waste and Resources Action Programme. Uh, we're an independent, not, not for profit uh, company. Uh, we primarily work for UK and uh, EU governments, uh, promoting resource efficiency and uh, product sustainability. So um, our job really is to, is to bring uh, business, uh, communities, and governments together. To um, make you know make it more efficiently um, bring it to the marketplace. Um, so that's my exam question. And uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, just kind of give you a bit of a slide some perspectives about um, resource efficiency um, from a UK perspective. So I'm not going to go through every policy um, in detail. So um, yeah, just yes, as a free pill, talking about the third one. Um, yeah, so first of all, um, just something about the, the evidence base. So, I mean, we've done a lot of evidence in this area. We've worked a lot in resource efficiency. In fact, this is Peter Work did about four years ago with the uh, Stockholm Environment Institute, looking at uh, their output models and looking at how resource efficiency strategies can actually uh, help mitigate climate change, but also see reduce the amount of materials um, uh, going into the economy. Um, and, and the key point about this one is that we um, really want to bring out is that um, of those 13 uh, strategies, I mean, there's four really key strategies which are on there, which is about lean production, manufacturing, waste production, generally across uh, the industrial economy, and lifetime optimization about durability of the things we make, and then good services. So the concept that we don't actually sell things uh, to people, but we sell services in change the whole 
way we um, structure the economy. Um, and I'll come back to that later on because that's actually uh, quite an important point. Um, so, the open space. So, in terms of the raw material initiative, um, you've heard an awful lot already today about um, what's going on uh, in terms of the waste framework directive, waste policy. Um, but the key document really um, where the UK government has responded to the RMI is the Resource Security Action Plan. Uh, now, I think it's important to understand here that in this document the drivers are clearly economic. Okay, so this is a document that is jointly written by DEFRA and BIS, which are the, um, the business department, and uh, also covering uh, other departments like the MOD, who are obviously interested in, um, in some of the scarce materials. Uh, so obviously the drivers are competition for resources, you know, the uh, demand for resources from an increasing population, uh, volatile prices that very much about the business uh, perspective. Um, and so the tone of the resource security action plan is very much around uh, what are the business risks, what are the business opportunities, and, um, and really about the need to provide information so that business out there can take the appropriate action. So it's very, um, no surprises really, um, you know, it's strictly non-interventionist by the government about letting the market actually act on the, having the right information. The one thing it does do is um, embrace the concept of circularity. So we've already heard about the circular economy, but that's coming up as a major theme uh, in Europe, in the UK, and, and in other countries as well. Um, and I think that one of the things I think really important um, is when we talk about the circular economy, you know, I think someone said earlier on, is this a kind of another, another buzzword, just another framework to talk about the things we're doing anyway? Um, I don't think it is. Um, so obviously, when you look at practical actions that we want to take in the circular economy, we do want to recycle more, but we also want to look at the products of the goods that we make and buy, and we want to keep them in the economy for longer. We want to be able to remanufacture things. We want to be able to restore and renovate things and repair things, keep them in the economy. So um, I think one of the best. Um, definitions I've got for the sort of circular economy was provided by the um, Alan MacArthur Foundation, and they said, uh, really drawing on the thinking from the 70s when we were thinking about, um, you know, biomimicry and that kind of thing. But if they said it was an industrial economy which is restorative by design, and I think that's the thing. It's actually by design. They're the two key words. So it's not about waiting for things to get to the end of their life and then wondering how are we going to do with them. It's about thinking about how we design things, how we structure the economy, how we manufacture things, how we consume things in such a way that we keep uh, the natural capital in the economy for as long as possible and keep the value. So that's a bit about the circular economy. So um, a lot of actions in there. The actions which relate to the resource efficiency, uh, there are a few of them there. The Circular Economy Task Force was set up, um, which is, uh, had been convened by Green Alliance, talking about that. Some work on innovation, which um, TSB, the Technology Strategy Board, providing funding for particularly small businesses to try out new concepts to make their product more circular. Um, so that point also about data, um, you know, one of the problems in this area was about, you know, where, if, where are these materials, where are they flowing, where are they going in the economy, and also finally wraps work particularly on the electrical sector. So, um, very quickly moving on. Oh yeah, I just wanted to say before I talk about that, um, the environment is involved in the UK, so you'll be aware that uh, north of the border in Scotland, the Scottish Government, but really in the way that they just published their waste prevention plan, which they had to do as part of the revised waste framework directive. Um, they're trying to blueprint for more resource efficient in social economy. There's a lot of engagement here. And I think it's really, really exciting that they, they, they've chosen this way. They really do see the link between uh, employment, uh, the economy, as well as uh, improving the environment. So um, to describe that permanent Scotland. So back to the Resource uh, Security Action Plan. 
what came out of it was another report. <laughs> uh, it's a federal economy task force today. Green Alliance, then they convened a group of uh, companies together. And um, so, let's get them right. So we had, um, we had a group of global companies like Unilever, BS, Air, Boots, uh, that was part of it. And then we have uh, observed from various government departments as well, trying to think about what, uh, how we take this uh, circular economy concept forward. And um, I think one of the interesting things that came out of that was when you talk with the businesses, and we, we talk about circular economy you know, in our little region, whether it's in the UK or Europe or, or Scotland, when you talk to big companies, big business, they're not interested in circular economies. What they're interested in is certain products. Um, so, you know, it, it, it goes beyond uh, the economic barriers. So I think that's one of the challenges that, to, to bear in mind when we, we think about developing the social economy and what kind of frameworks we want. Um, but anyway, the, um, I'm not going to get through all the actions that, um, that they came out with. And um, I mean, they have been in line back to the government with some, some of these ideas. But to pick up the first one about greater collaboration within sectors, a lot of feedback we got um, from businesses was about the challenge of the social economy is so big um, and the need to work together uh, the, uh, and the idea of actually having pre competitive collaboration. Um, and that's something that Matt is, is incredibly supportive of. I mean, I think somebody mentioned earlier the idea of um, the businesses coming together responsibly, uh, the kind of stewardship approach that you see in forestry and other areas. Um, that, there's a lot of work with uh, businesses in the UK around establishing what we call voluntary agreements and what we do, we bring businesses together to provide a framework, uh, a dialogue in, in a safe environment. We establish targets for the sector, and that's quite important actually, because DEFRA, we've heard, DEFRA do not particularly uh, favour of, uh, of targets, but, um, but they're very happy for businesses to come together and actually develop their own targets, challenging targets. So we are very involved in this. How long? A couple of minutes? Right, take it. Anyone from that? So, yeah, I just wanted to say something about the um, material phase work, because again, it's got quite interesting earlier when people were saying, oh gosh, you know, we don't know where these materials are. Uh, because of that, another um, people in, in our uh, area, they focused on the products at the end of life. Um, it's very important to us to know where. Where, um, where materials are flowing. And this is an excellent piece of work that um, OD and Hollins have done for us. And uh, what they did was um, look at the whole electrical sector and all the different categories, looked at all the different metals, the key metals um, in that sector, and they broke them out. And I'll just show you one here to exemplify this, but this is actually published materials. So if some of you are interested in where these materials are going, where the products are, um, and you know, this is within the UK and outside the UK, uh, there's some great information there. And we use this to really start looking at some of the hotspots um, and try to work out where we can focus. But very quickly, we on. Um, <coughs> yeah, so, I mean, I, I don't want to really tell you everything we're doing here. So I think one of the things I noticed about the social economy is just to say that um, it's very easy for people to fall back on what we know. Um, I think recycling is still a really important thing that you all need to be aware about getting material back into the economy. But where the real value comes is, um, is actually uh, in the goods and the products and the components we make. There's a huge amount of in, um, capital, uh, labour gone into making things. So, I mean, I just think about thinking, rethinking about our business models, extend durability and product life, comp uh, provide consumers with access not ownership, particularly the younger generation, they love the assets, they just need to own stuff. The meat manufacturing and repairing our assets, so it's about retaining the value in the goods we already have. So we don't need the goods we're already important to the UK. We have an awful lot of scarce materials. And, you know, we really have you no know, um, policy and no action, really, to kind of recover these uh, in, within the products. So just to finish off, um, Finally, you, you did ask me a little bit about what the barriers are on, and um, just show you this um, talk about, um, there it shows something down some kind of targets uh, we have. But in fact, what we've done in that is actually developed some targets. I mean, if you actually look back at the environmental um, environmental accounts, 
between 2000 and 2010, you know, if the UK economy did get more circular, if you go have a look at that website, the all the information there, that's something that we've done for 2020, which was published and uh, talked to the UK government about how we make the economy more circular. So I won't go through that, but that's actually a lot more circular than it is today. That's the explanation. And in terms of the barriers, I think what I'd be worried about in terms of developing, we need to develop a framework for action. Um, there are not enough drivers there for people to really put forward with a circular economy. Um, we need to understand the scale of the circularity. Um, do we need to be doing it at more regional scale, national level, EU level? Where we should not be done at the European level, because it's so little of them in the UK, we need to be thinking about that. We need to be thinking about sector collaboration to de risk, um, you know, changing business models for, for, for business. Um, and then finally, I think the final point really, we need to think about, businesses need to think about how to develop more better relationships with their customers. So in a linear economy, all the focus of a business has been back down their supply chains. Yes, that still needs to happen, but I think in an in economy going forward, it's about looking to your consumers, not as somebody who you sell something to, but actually somebody who has actually got the materials that you can reaccess and bring back into your business. So a completely different relationship, where it's almost like not a consumer, but almost like a, almost like a contract with your consumers going forward. So, that's all.